Hi, I'm Lisa Singer, and I am the event editorial manager at Media Post, and this is Insider Summit, BTS, where we sort of get a look behind the curtain on some of the most influential women marketers. And today with me is Vivian Chang, and she is the VP of Growth Clorox D2C at the Clorox Company. Hey, Vivian, thank you for coming. Or Hi, Lisa. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Joining from yes. our respective... Uh, Zoom rooms. Uh, I, really. I, am. I can't wait till we're back in person, but I'm just so excited because I've like talked with you so many times. You've been a part of so many of our summits. Um, and then to be able to, it's funny when I was looking about you and finding out more about you, I'm like, wow, she does like, you are very impressive. It's just like, and you, I don't know where you have time to do anything because <laughs> you have so many things on your plate. And one of the things I want to mention in general, I saw that you were um, a member of Chief and Speak Her. And so I know that's, I mean, a, I mean, one, I'm sure that takes up a lot of time, but also just why these particular groups, what, what really, you know, resonated with you that you wanted to, you know, put your time to that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, glad that you're asking about it. Uh, as I have been incredibly fortunate to have opportunities in my career and opportunities to advance and to lead teams, one of the things that always has been a little bit hard is how to show up fully myself with all of the different parts of my identity. Yes, some of it is certainly the gender side of um, there's, a, there's still a lot of forces out there. Um, that tell us to conform a certain way. And so for me, I love both of these organizations that I'm part of, Chief, with you know, great high power executive women that even I can look up to, aspire to, um, but it's also a great just group to bounce ideas off of. Uh, everyone is incredibly supportive, open to sharing, very candid about real life issues. And I think that these things have to get talked about more often. Speaker, on the other side is, I love the platform that I've gotten through media posts, through Acro summits and all of these different industry things to kind of represent and to be a voice and a, a person on the stage that is Chinese American woman. Um, and I want to be able to pass that down more to get more women who are more junior in their careers that speaking opportunity. And that's really everything that Speak Her is about. Um, so it's um, getting support from other like-minded um, kind of senior women. And then on the other side, helping to support and to bring uh, more junior women up. Yeah, well, and I'm curious in terms of um, when you're talking about helping junior women and bringing them up. I don't know, I'm, I know Katie Couric right now, she's promoting a book and I heard her talking and, or, and she was sort of giving blurbs from the book and she had mentioned how she didn't necessarily um, maybe help as much as she would have liked to because she was, you know, there's limited amount of opportunities for her type of position that she had say on the Today Show or where, wherever, um, you know, all the other positions she's had. And so it almost made her close herself off to helping. She kind of regrets that. At, but that was her feeling at the time. It was more, and it's understandable. There are a limited amount. And sometimes as we get older, maybe those opportunities don't come to the older woman, but then you want to be there to help the younger woman get through. So did you ever combat that? Or do you ever meet anyone who maybe is dealing with that? And you know, what do you say to them? What do you find, you know, like maybe to give someone the confidence to say, look, we just need to sort of keep reaching out, leaning forward, as they say. Yeah. Um, in a way, I feel like I've been fortunate in that I've always been able to find some kind of path forward without feeling like I am fighting for that one spot. There can only be one woman in, in that role. Um, what that allows though is usually openings behind me where I'm hoping that other women can step into. Uh, and, and I think what you were saying about kind of younger women versus like more senior, a lot of these industry conferences, people want to know the in the weeds executional, like what are you learning? What are some really tangible nuggets that they can take back? I'm honestly not in the best place to, to speak to the in, in the weeds piece anymore. And so it really, is a better platform for somebody else to, to go in and, and to share. And what, I'm, what I find is that there's a lot of just hesitancy or not wanting to raise your hand to like be that person, even though you 
you know, someone might have the knowledge and that's what I'm trying to encourage is, yeah, you know, I certainly am not and was not the best speaker, um, but, I, but I did it um, and have survived and you get better with practice. And that's the message I'm really trying to uh, encourage other women to really internalize and to say, yes, I'm gonna try it. And it doesn't have to be amazing and perfect the very first time. There's some low, low stakes ways to start out. Yeah. Is there a, someone in your past that maybe, you know, as you said, you have been very fortunate, but through a lot of work, you know, so it's, there's a lot of that goes into that path. Was there someone maybe along the way and maybe another woman or perhaps not, but someone who you feel like just sort of gave you that little boost or reached out their hand to you that helped you along the way? Yeah, I, I do think I've had strong, um, managers and mentors in a way. Um, and, and they're all, not all women. Um, I think I've also had great um, men sponsors um, who saw the potential and were willing to, to kind of put me into stretch positions along the way, or maybe saw the potential of, yeah, you could move into that next level. Um, and then I, I would say, if, particularly at Retail Me Now, I've had kind of two great leaders, you know, Brett, who is kind of that sponsor that I said, and then Marissa Charlton, who made, who got herself up to CEO. Um, you know, that was always a great example. And to hear is how, how she thought and how she approached that role um, and how it was different uh, from others. That was really inspiring and helpful for me um, to see and you know, just to, to understand that, hey, maybe it's possible for someone like me. Yeah, no, and I agree, like seeing more women in that kind of position than someone who's coming out of school can look at that and say, I can aspire to do something like that. And exactly. well, I mean, let's, let's back up, up a little bit when you were coming out of school. And so, you know, what were your ambitions? What were you sort of, did you have any ceiling on what you thought you could do? And then as your career evolved, it, you know, kind of kept rising or, you know, tell me about that and how you led to where you are today. Yeah, um, I always say in retrospect, it's a lot more clear of a path than it felt like at the time um, when I really have spent most of my career in marketing and advertising, but it was less of a deliberate decision. I'm not one of those people who lay out a five-year, a 10-year plan, but I will gravitate towards what's that next new exciting thing that gives me a chance to learn something new and to maybe gain more skill set along the way. And so I did start my career in search marketing at a time when search marketing was in its infancy. It was, you know, you didn't even have sophisticated algorithms. You said, I want to pay 10 cents CPC and you literally pay 10 cents CPC. <laughs> That's how it was. And so at search marketing for a while, I got to grow as the industry grew. Uh, and then when mobile apps launched, uh, I also had the opportunity to help Retail Me, Retail Me Not launch their first mobile app. And so same thing, it was applying those core skills of analytics, data, merge with creative, creative strategy, audience targeting to get results. Um, and along the way, it's always been building contacts with other marketers, the other vendors, technology providers, having conversations about what's the next new thing to test? What's on the horizon? What should we be trying? Um, I feel like that curiosity and that drive to learn is really what has created this path for myself. Um, and I, I couldn't have told you when I was graduating what I would be doing, um, but I am incredibly grateful for all of the things that I've been able to see from a MarTech landscape and all the changes that we've gone through uh, and be a, a part of the conversation now with you know, continual challenges as this, um, this space keeps evolving. Yeah. And I was actually surprised that you were quite the um, little techie. <laughs> you know, I didn't realize you were so, you know, I mean, a lot of your background, that's where you came from. And then even the, um, which, is it the she, which one, the group that um, I mentioned up top, one of them is for, for specifically speaker, yeah, that speaker for um, tech oh. positions. And I, I was, yeah. that was something, because when we speak, it's always about the marketing strategy and more of the, you know, the media mix and that kind of thing. So I didn't realize you were so data oriented. Where did that come from? Was that just who you were growing up? Did you have this analytical mind? 
Um, I think yes and no. Uh, where I actually feel like marketing was the perfect fit for me because it is that blend of there's the analytical and the data side and the practical, which I definitely am, but then also kind of the art side of like, the emotions and what drives motivation. And it really is bringing those things together. I don't think I could be, you know, a pure programmer or data scientist where I'm just looking at data all the time. I'm also not a, you know, copywriter, creative designer. Um, it's that intersection that it has always been the most interesting to me. Um, and so I think my approach always has been really just, yes, like, break it down for me so I really understand the in the weeds specifics and details and from there I understand that higher level strategy and that's kind of how I get there and so my career is a lot of that too I was a hands-on keyboard operator for a long for a long time and I think that has helped me as a leader because I really know what's going on behind the scenes well, it must also make you stronger in your position now where you are overseeing so many people and so, you know, like, or just so, it's just, it, you have much more, um, your role has a lot more say in terms of what's happening. So to understand all aspects of it must um, really put you at more of an advantage than perhaps if you didn't have that creative side or didn't have that analytical side. Yeah. Yeah, I, at least I'd like to think so, right? I, I'm comfortable having those conversations with people on either side um, and focusing on looking for those connections that we can bridge together. Um, and you know, sometimes they might seem disparate to others. And I think that's kind of one of my superpowers is to be able to see you know, how these things can come together and become you know, more effective for the broader good. Yeah, no, I, I especially well now today, everyone, it's all about data, data. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, and of course, creative plays a big part, but you can't really have one without the other, you know, and I think exactly. that obviously, you know, you can just have both sides of your brain <laughs> going to work instead of having to bring in two separate people from the different, you know, your different teams. But, um, but let me ask you in terms of throughout your career life, you know, either side, um, has there been like a silver lining? I, that's, I've, I always asked everyone during COVID and now I like to ask it that time when it was something that was just could have been, you know, the worst day of your life. And then it turned into, wow, this actually was the best thing that could have happened. That's a great question. Um, and COVID is certainly on my mind. Um, so maybe I'll address the short-term piece, right? I actually do think that this move towards greater flexibility greater trust in employees to get your work done without needing to be butts in seats and being able to see every person. I think that that's a good trend. Um, let people figure out the right way to do their work time and their family time and whatever else it is. Um, I, I know for myself, that was important during COVID too. You know, I did some road tripping and was able to work remote. And um, that was a nice kind of antidote to all of the other kind of very heavy things going on in the world that we've all lived through for the last 18 months. So, you know, that's certainly one. I think thinking about my overall career, um, I, in a way, it has been like what I said at the beginning, fi about figuring out what my identity is um, as an employee in a company, but then over time, like what it is as a leader. Um, I am not the loudest voice in any room. I don't ever aspire to be, um, I am a little bit quieter, um, but, and so I think early days, yeah, I got messages sometimes that made it feel like, you know, that's not the way to be, you have to correct for it. And over time, it's been a process of leaning more and more into that and figuring out how that makes me a more compassionate leader, or I can like understand some of the emotional dynamics that are happening when it's a meeting that feels like it's really kind of conflict ridden um, and take that step back and say like, hey, how do we actually address this? Um, and so I, to me, that's kind of that macro level silver lining that uh, is about finding my own self-confidence leaning into it. Um, and, and it's taken a lot of time to get there. 
Yeah, no, like you said, baby steps, but that's all it really can be when you're moving forward in terms of, especially when it is not who you are innately. You know, as you said, you t you're more quiet and you have to kind of learn to move forward that way. Mm -hmm. I love what you mentioned when you talked a little bit about COVID because I, I'm curious, like there, you know, obviously we've seen certain advantages, you know, horrible things otherwise, but there have been things. And one of them, which you mentioned about everyone being able to kind of work from home, but also we've sort of been brought into everyone's homes. You know, here we are, we're speaking to each other from our homes and, you know, talking with your, your staff, you know, people you work with and you're seeing kids run by or you, you know you're seeing husbands walk by or wives so i'm just curious do you feel like it's brought another level of personal into the workplace and how will that be moving forward do you think that's a better thing or um do you think we'll just sort of go back to you know status quo once we're once we're fully out of all of this yeah um i don't believe there's like there's a going back. Um, I think companies that think that we can just rewind the clock and just be everyone back in nine to five, Monday through Friday, and not talking about personal lives, I think they're they're fooling themselves. We see it in where workers are wanting to go. They're demanding you know flexibility. Some only want to do remote work. Um, for me. Certainly, we, we saw a lot more of the behind the curtain personal lives of people. I had a COVID puppy. And so my oh. coworkers had to deal with like a dog jumping up like every meeting <laughs> wanting attention <laughs> and just had to apologize for it. Um, but I leaned into it, right? It was like every week at our like staff meeting, like what's the newest update on Piper? And I would bring her <laughs> into the screen. Oh, and I think it's name. just like, <laughs> thank you. She? Uh, she's a rescue dog, so she's cattle dog, terrier, Maltese, like every breed oh. under the sun. <laughs> oh, well, I'm sure it's a hand, she's a handful because right there, the terrier, the cattle dog, and the Maltese. I'm, I had a Maltese mix, um, and they're um, they're awesome. They couldn't be better. She's an awesome dog, but when she was a puppy trying to do work, like. <laughs> They had no they had no idea of what was a schedule, that it was an important meeting or anything you like mean that. You mean you can't and, play with me all the time, 24-7. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but I think that it's good. And it's something even pre-COVID that I've learned to share more about my own personal life and uh, not trying to come off as too perfect. I think that invites more conversation and more trust building one-on-one um, -on -one with uh, employees. I don't think we want to just talk about work all of the time. Um, and so COVID has made it that much easier because we've now seen everyone's kids, seen everyone's uh, mm -hmm. pets and homes to ask about you know, more than work. Like, you know, how are your kids and how's homes, you know, how's virtual homeschooling going? And um, that, you know, it's all about creating a bridge and a connection, right? And it can be commiserating about all of us being stuck in homes with like dogs and kids and things mm -hmm. causing a ruckus. And it's still helping to lay a foundation that then makes the work more, more enjoyable, I think, for everyone. And, you know, when there's a conflict, it's not just about a conflict because you actually know that person. Yeah. And it, it's, I think, builds that trust. As you said, more, you know, you're more honest, like as far as you're more you, you know, you're not perfect. And maybe that gives someone who works either beside you or, you know, under you or whatever, whatever position they're in, but they may feel then the freedom to express something that's not good for them right now, you know, that keep that open communication. Yeah. And that's something that we've obviously been fighting to get past this past year, especially, but even, you know, earlier than that. So maybe it opens that gap, you know, up so people feel yeah. more freedom to say what they need to. And I think we've seen, right, there are studies that say the more um, diversity of perspectives drives to stronger business results. And I think it has to be embracing the full person, not just, yeah, that you have a different perspective on this business problem. So then how are we creating space for true diversity in the workplace? And I think it starts with allowing kind of these conversations and not having to be perfect, not having to conform to a certain way or a certain life. Um, and so I, 
I hope that this is a trend that's here to stay and that, you know, companies are actively thinking about this. Yeah. And I mean, we've also seen coming out of this past year, especially, I mean, as I said, it's been happening, but really it came full front in terms of having more inclusivity, um, not with, not only within the workplace, but just in terms of how brands are marketing themselves and how they're putting things out there and, um, and just speaking out against something that is wrong, you know, whether it be a, towards a certain community, a gender, you know, whatever it may be. Do you feel as, as a marketer in your position for a brand that you work with, you have that voice. Do you feel it's sort of a responsibility to lend that voice for those who aren't in the spotlight or, cause it's also a difficult thing cause some brands it's hard for them to do perhaps. So there must, there needs, there needs to be a path but it may not be the same as another brand where it's an easier thing to sort of step up. What do you, what do you feel about yeah. that? Yeah, I think that's right. Um... And we had a lot of these conversations internally uh, over the last, you know, 18 months and so forth. Um, and there, I'd say, I don't think there's a right way. Like companies have to kind of struggle and think about it. We, for, for some of the brands, we just felt like we haven't really done enough and we're not the experts. And so we're not going to try and enter into some of these conversations and to just be there because then it will come off too much as like, we're just here as a marketing campaign. It's better to stay quiet. Um, on the other hand, there are small things about like being more deliberate about diversity and inclusion on, you know, photo shoots about the people who are actually doing the work. Um, I think it has to happen in the background first before it manifests to what shows externally. Um, and so I'd say we're, I wouldn't say that we're the gold standard. Um, it, it's hard as a, a large company to pivot quickly and to figure out you know, what's that right stance, but we have made media decisions about which publishers we'll work with and which ones we won't. Um, what kind of you know, messaging and creative are we, are we putting out there, but also are we willing to show against or like next to contextually? Um, and so those are the, some of those things that a consumer probably won't see, um, but those are the types of iterative changes that we're adopting. Well, and I think it kind of goes back to even what you said earlier in terms of that diversity of mindset, but also that having that diversity within the company that are, the organization, then it's gonna come from, you know, you're not, it's not someone, you're speaking truth to whatever community you're reaching out to. Like you're, you're hearing from so many different ages, from so many different groups of people, and so you're going to get all of these opinions that are, you know, they've really experienced that world. And I think then you're going to see more truth and more authentic uh, messaging coming out of the brand. Yeah, absolutely. I think authenticity is, is key right now. And you see it even becoming even more and more important as you know, something that millennials and Gen Zers will make purchase decisions and brand loyalty decisions against. And so uh, I think it's better to stay kind of like in our lane on something that we really, that does come from the brand ethos rather than kind of get blown, blown by the wind on like, what's the latest like mm -hmm. trend or fad and, and you know, try to adopt everything. Right, because then they tend to get caught doing something else because but, you know, it's not part of, as you said, it's not yeah. really their ethos. And then that's much more worse in terms of backlash. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, we'll move on to this in, in a minute, but I just, I do want to ask you personally, you know, I mean, I know there was a lot of hate crimes against Asian communities. How did that make you feel um, just as yourself being Asian? And, you know, even you talked earlier about wanting to see Asian women moving up within the, um, you know, in the workforce. It, what about as a community in terms of seeing that? I mean, it must've been heartbreaking, but it must've been really, as someone like you who wants to get involved and help, that must've really triggered you a lot. Yeah, um, thank you for asking, first of all. And um, I will say it, I think the amount of impact that it had on me personally actually took me by surprise. Um, to some extent, I was kind of used to some amount of like, 
yeah, you get kind of these slights here and there and you just ignore them and you go on with your day, right? Um, I think seeing it at the scale going across the US, um, especially against the elderly, just made it that much more real that it's not just about myself where I might be going through, you know, these like slights or name calling, you know, here and there, but it's actually a systemic issue. Um, and yeah, I think if anything, that was more saddening to face the reality than anything. Um, for, and so I think the approach for me was, was twofold. One was really just like mental well being. Um, making sure to check in on my community of other Asians, Asian Americans and so forth. Um, but it has, it continues to be the fuel for why I want to be out there, one, growing my career. Um, so I'm creating more space for other minority women, but also speaking um, to you, to others, right? Like on panels, even if it's not related to this at all. Um, I will often have side conversations um, with others about you know, what my experience has been maybe coming up or like they'll connect with me on LinkedIn and we may, you know, I may be able to help them down the line. Um, and those are the small interactions that actually really matter to me. And I think it's, um, it's more about adding up enough of these like small interactions to to have a wave in the future not just like one big splash that solves everything well and i think part of this past year although we have seen a lot of big splashes which we needed but i think a lot of it too is the baby steps are just as important it's that something that's going yeah. to you don't because we've had moments where everyone is standing up against something and then it goes away it's sort of a fad it's that and I think that's what everyone's waiting to see that what's happening now, the changes that we're seeing are gonna maintain rather than again, fade away once it's no longer the, you know, the marketing or whatever you wanna call it, the, the, the top story. Yeah. And I, you know, back to kind of everything we talked about, um, I've been able to have conversations about race and identity and all of that in workplace settings with other coworkers that I would never have imagined I would be having, you know, three, five years ago. Um, and yeah, they're tough, but I think it's a good thing. Like that's how we all get better collectively is to understand each other's stories. Yeah, no, I agree. All right, well, this is, there's no way to say, and, <laughs> and to be right on target, um, but I, I'm curious. If you could live in any time period, any era, what would it be? Ooh, I really don't know. Um, there's a part of me that I love outdoors and nature. Um, and so I'm always a little bit curious of like, go pre-technology when, when life was simple, it was just like, wake up, work on a farm, <laughs> like be around friends and family and that's it. Um, so not directly answering your question, I guess. Um, yeah. I, I was but, afraid you were going to say something, you know, back in the caveman day. <laughs> like, so we're not going that yeah, far. Not quite, yeah, not, not quite that far. No one's pulling you around <laughs> with your hair. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I think I'll take like late 1800s or something like that and be fine. Um, the other butter, like, milking the cow, that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe something like that. Um, and of course, there's, uh, I think, where I for sure am fascinated, you know, Bridgerton and all of you know, Downton Abbey of all of that just seems like kind of a fun, almost like Halloween, put on a costume for a while. <laughs> kind you of you need to leave the country for that one <laughs> and head over, head over to London and then you can uh, experience that side of it. Uh, is that exactly. one of your, I'm curious, what, do you have any guilty pleasures? Ooh, um, I, so I actually cook very rarely um, these days, part of it because I live in New York City and um, there's just always something going on outside the apartment. I love watching cooking shows, like Great British Bake Off, Chops, Food Network, like I can turn it on and sit there and watch it forever, which is 
especially ironic because I'm not actually doing any of the things that I'm watching and I have no interest in doing it, but (laughs) I'm not cooking. I'm not using any of the sauce recipes that they're demoing, but um, for some reason I get sucked in every time. I actually, I love watching them, but I tend to like, if it's something that looks good, then I'll go online and I, I cut and paste the, the, you know, cause they always will post the recipe and I have like files of like all these different recipes and some I go use, some are just sitting there and mm-hmm. hopefully I'll get to them one day. But I, I do see what you mean. It's just interesting to see how when they start with one thing and then, I don't know, I would love to be a good cook. Like, I think that that would be, I, yeah. you know, just to know how all the spices work and all of that kind of thing. So. I just feel uh, like there's something like amazing. I really do think that they're like artists with like everything they're able to do and then like just create something you can never Mm -hmm. imagine. And so I think that's the part of it that fascinates me is kind of see this, see the process and see their thinking, Um, but not enough to make me actually want to try it. (laughs) But if it's with what you, you like that analytical side and you also like the creative side and that's basically true. And thought about (laughs) that. Yeah. It definitely fits into that. Well, for my last question, I just want to ask, um, if you couldn't be a marketer, if you couldn't be in marketing, what would you be doing? Uh, Anyone who knows me knows I love traveling and I have a serious case of wanderlust. I can't stay in one place for too long. So I think if I weren't a marketer, I would actually run like a bed and breakfast in some place um, in Europe and you know just meet people who have interesting stories as they come through um, and you know have a nice comfy place that they can rest for a while. I thought you were going to say then you would want to like be taking people on these so then you can do the traveling with them so instead you yeah, like Paris, we know. Will live through what they come and visit. Live through them and provide the experience. And I think that's part of what I love is you go to a place and you get that full experience and the you know, hotel and the place you stay is such a big part of it, the local food. And so I think be able to craft that for people. Very cool. Well, I would go stay. <laughs> Maybe it's in the it's in future plans for me. Yes, you'll have to keep me posted. Well, Vivian, thank you so much. I really, I'm so glad, like I said, I've talked to you so many times, but I didn't know any of these things about you. So I just love that we were able to uh, talk this way and I could learn all of this from you. Thank you so much. I really love that you all are doing this. It's fascinating for me also to hear other women's stories. So thank you. No, I mean, thank you. And um, thank you. We are doing this each week. So please, if you have anyone you want me to sort of pull back the curtains on, just let me know and I will do my best to get them. And um, otherwise, thanks. And till then.